thanks for asking me to give this talk today. I have to say that once I'd agreed to do it, I immediately regretted my decision because it's really not an easy subject to address. There are so many things that have changed this year, and I don't think we yet have the answers to all of the problems that we've confronted. But what I've tried to do is to look at some of the issues that we've grappled with and had to reflect on over the year. And I hope that what I'm covering will be of some uh, use, at least in terms of stimulating some debate about how we go forward. Just a reminder, the reality of it is that for many of us, much of the field work that we do became impossible. Now, of course, not all researchers do primary data collection. Many are analyzing data from existing surveys or doing systematic reviews, but we do quite a lot of work on the ground. And in my case, uh, with uh, cre creating major challenges, we were doing work in countries like Malaysia, the Philippines, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, where we simply could not do the work that we had scheduled. The other thing was that there's been no possibility to attend project meetings or conferences in person. And that poses certain challenges because, of course, we've been able to use Zoom and Teams and WebEx and WhatsApp and all sorts of other media, but they're not quite the same. Again, something I'll reflect on in a minute. Researchers have had to balance work and domestic responsibilities. Well, my children are now growing up. Um, they're researchers in their own right, and uh, so we haven't had to deal with young children running around the house. But for my younger colleagues who have had to, it's been very difficult. Then, of course, many of us have had to refocus our work on COVID-19 research and particularly on policy engagement. So we'll think about that too. There have been delays in existing projects and crucially, policymakers who are looking to us for answers need them yesterday, not in six months time. So what I'd like to cover are a couple of issues, fieldwork in a pandemic, mutual support within research teams, what I call the tyranny of Zoom, the question of dissemination, publish, perish, pre-publish or tweet, redirecting research towards COVID, and then something about science policy and our responsibilities to engage with the public and with politicians. So let's start with some of the challenges of doing field work during a pandemic. There are several implications of the pandemic. First, we have had to develop, design, implement at great speed new studies which address aspects of the pandemic, uh, aspects of the transmission of COVID, aspects of the response and so on. And secondly, even when we've done that, we've had to change them often at short notice because of the situation changing, lockdowns, the release of lockdowns and so on. And of course, COVID has had huge implications for studies that have nothing to do with it. We've had to look at changes in procedures, how we conduct interviews, for example. It's had an impact on timelines. It's had an effect on budgets and grant periods. And of course, we've been having to wrestle with funders, some of whom have been more sympathetic than others. Now, of course, I could write an entire book or give an entire lecture on the challenges of doing fieldwork during a pandemic, but I'm going to limit myself and perhaps look primarily at some of the ethical challenges that are arising. Because of course, the IRBs, the ethics committees that we report to, are requiring us to adhere to the same principles as we would do at normal times. We need to get informed consent to ensure privacy and confidentiality, data security. We need to work out what to do if we need to refer people for treatment, for example, as a result of something we discover. We have to ask ourselves, is, really, is this really the right time to do research? Because particularly if we're looking at the responses of people working in organizations, much organizational research, the situation has changed entirely and anything we find might not be generalizable to more normal times. And we need to think whether remote data collection is going to become the new norm. So what changes do we need to make if we are to get informed consent for research from the participants? The first thing is that if we've got work that's already in progress at the beginning of the pandemic, we may need to change the consent 
uh, sheets, the patient information sheets. They may need to be then distributed in a different way. We need to tailor them to the new ways of data collection. And of course, the challenge is that we have to go back to the ethics committees and we hope that they will respond more quickly than they usually do, recognising the urgency of the situation, but we shouldn't underestimate the time available. It's important to note that consent can be written even if people are not actually holding a pen. There are other ways of writing in this day and age, for example, in an electronic signature or a text confirmation, but of course those do require that people do have access to the appropriate types of equipment. And consent can be verbal, and this is perfectly reasonable with audio recording or perhaps um, written check sheet records. So the, the problems are there, but they're not insurmountable. But what we do need is that ethics committees understand the challenges that we face and are able to be flexible and to respond quickly. And I want to talk a little bit about mutual support within research teams. OK, you can see my background in the picture here. Um, many people have seen it on media appearances across the world. I'm really lucky. I've got a fantastic study in my house. I've got all the facilities I need. I've got uh, fast broadband. I've got laptops. I've got uh, good communications. And that's great. But not everybody has. And we need to remember, particularly for more for early career researchers, that they may be living in a one bedroom flat. They may be in a home with multiple occupancy. Uh, they may have children running around that they've got to look after. They're juggling with homeschooling at the same time as trying to do their work. And I think it's really important for those of us who are in a more privileged situation to reach out and to make sure that we support people. Certainly, I and I'm sure many other people in my position have been doing much more work on mentoring early career researchers, in, in my case, in many different countries, and trying to listen and understand the challenges that people face. So I would just encourage you, if you are somebody of my generation, really to reach out and make sure you do that. And just try to get yourself into the shoes of those who are struggling at a time like this, because it really isn't easy. Let's talk about the tyranny of Zoom. Many of us are spending hours every day. I can have days when I'm spending eight to 10 hours on Zoom. So what do we do to try to minimize the challenges that this poses? So I've been reading around a little bit for advice from others, and what do they say? Well, one paper talked about learning to overcome the presence of absence. Uh, which they describe as a deep state of heaviness and separation on Zoom, because we are together virtually, but we're separated physically. You don't have those opportunities to raise your eyebrows when you're looking at somebody or a non-verbal communication in quite so many ways that you would have around a table. You might look down and shuffle your papers in a very visible way. We communicate in many other ways just than simply talking to one another. And also, it's very easy to switch off. You can switch off your camera, of course. Um, there are people who thought they switched off their camera when they were doing other things. I won't go into it. I'm sure you've heard the stories. So be careful uh, that you really have. But also, it's really important that we try to engage with everybody and make sure people are not feeling left out. Remember, again, particularly some more inexperienced and perhaps insecure of our colleagues may f feel it rather difficult to break into established hierarchies, and we have a responsibility to encourage that. Um, I like this one. In this particular article, there was a lot of other advice I'm not uh, using here about uh, Zoom makeup and so on. Clearly, it doesn't apply to me uh, with a face for radio. But uh, it, uh, this advice also said that staring at your face for hours on end is probably affecting your mental well-being. Yes, I can echo that. Um, so it, it advised us to focus on our best bits if we can find them. But more practically, avoiding multitasking. We all do it. Uh, you know, we're on a conference call, but we're not really engaged. We're putting in references into it. No, that's my guilty secret. Uh, we're um, editing documents, um, we're doing all sorts of other things. Build in breaks. There should never be one hour Zoom meetings. They should be 50 minute meetings because then you've got 10 minutes to get a coffee and go to the bathroom in between. 
try to reduce on-screen stimuli, and this is something I haven't done. You'll see uh, hypocrisy here, but we're advised to encourage play, play in backgrounds. Try to make social events on Zoom opt-in, they advise. Now, a number of units, a number of departments do try to bring their team together uh, to um, have uh, to bring people together in social networks, but people can feel pressurized. Try to use phone calls or email from time to time and don't do everything on Zoom. Publish, perish, pre-publish or tweet. How do we disseminate in a time of a pandemic? Well, one of the things we have seen is that medical journals are reviewing papers faster, but that is almost entirely due to COVID papers being reviewed faster. Other papers are, if anything, being reviewed a little bit slower. And we also know that there has been an enormous upsurge in coronavirus research, as this graph of preprints and journal articles shows. And this is something that I confess I've been guilty of contributing to, and I guess many of you have been too. And the difficulty is separating out uh, the, those that are worth reading from those that are not. We have had preprints because, of course, in the middle of a pandemic, when we need the evidence quickly, we simply cannot wait for the months that it can take to go through the review process and uh, then eventually to get into print. So preprints are becoming increasingly popular. They're the way that people are communicating. And in many ways, this is good because we are getting good information. But unfortunately, we're also getting not so good information. And here are two of the more notorious studies that you may be familiar with. The Santa Clara study uh, suggesting that a very high proportion of the population already had immunity to COVID, uh, which was not the case. And a similar study that got a lot of media attention, not least because it was press released by a, an agency with links to politicians, uh, which uh, suggested that uh, at a very early stage in the pandemic, there, we were already close to herd immunity. And therefore, this and, and its authors in particular have been very much in the forefront of arguing for not having restrictions and more recently for arguing that we maybe don't need vaccinations. So we have to be really careful with preprints. They've got many good points, but there are many problems too. Twitter actually is where I get an awful lot of my information. Now, we all know that there's a lot of nonsense on that. Uh, fortunately, a lot less since uh, Donald Trump and many of his supporters were taken off Twitter. And that's quite interesting in terms of my colleagues who have looked at the number of accounts that are supporting electronic cigarettes that disappeared in that clean out. But here are some of the few people that I follow that I find to be very helpful. But there are many others, uh, Christina and uh, Sarah Rasmussen, particularly good on schools, Susan on, um, on, on behavioral sciences and Adam on modeling and uh, so on. So I think if you follow the right people, you really do get insights that you're going to miss otherwise. What about redirecting research during a pandemic? Well, here we were faced with the problem of a new infection, enormous knowledge gaps, even though there was huge progress made earlier, the very rapid sequencing of the genome, but people were dying and there was really no time to wait for a peer reviewed publication. Time was of the essence. How were we going to generate evidence quickly? And crucially, how much evidence is enough to act? The recovery trial was one of the rare successes in the UK. We haven't done much very well. We got the vaccine rollout right, but we failed on testing and tracing. And we, of course, delayed our restrictions. And, uh, you know, that's why we have such high death rates and such a big hit to the economy. But this was good because it was an opportunity for almost every patient who was admitted to hospital to be invited to be part of a clinical trial. This is how we find out that chloroquine did not work. It's how we find that dexamethasone did work. And looking ahead, we really need to make sure that we have a, a system in place, the infrastructure there, so that in many countries, the protocols have been pre-approved. They'll need to be tailored a little bit to the particular cause of the pandemic. The Ethics Committee uh, approvals are there in principle, even if they just need to be adapted a little bit and signed off. And everything is ready to go. We cannot have the delays that we have had in so many countries in trying to understand what the nature of this, uh, what the, the best treatments were for this pandemic. 
But I think we can expand that into all sorts of other areas of the sort of questions we can anticipate will arise in a new pandemic, such as the nature of the spread of the particular microorganism and the measures that might be in, implemented to reduce that. Moving on from that, we have the question of how much evidence we need. And we have had heated debates all the way through, for example, about the role of masks or face coverings. And I think this has highlighted a real schism in the health research community. There are those who will argue that the absence of evidence should mean that something should not be implemented, and particularly the absence of evidence from a clinical trial. Yet here we are in an emergency when we need to do something. So what do we do? Face coverings were a particularly interesting example because once you realize that their role was to, as a form of source control to prevent individuals infecting other people, so where the intervention was applied to one individual and the outcome was measured in other individuals who would not have an opportunity to consent or even may not be easy to identify. You can see the challenges that were involved. So holding out for clinical trial evidence certainly was not the way forward here. But there were lots of other ways of doing it. Natural experiments, as in Germany, uh, taking insights from fluid engineers, aerosol engineers and, and others. And I think we now everybody accepts that they are playing a very important role, but it took a long time for us to get there. Now we talk, we can come to science policy and ask what are our responsibilities as scientists? Now there are many people in many branches of science and in public health who argue that it is sufficient for us to put our data in the public domain. We should not, they argue, be getting involved in operational or policy matters. We should not be uh, having a view on the decisions of politi politicians. And that is, as I say, very strongly held. And uh, certainly the work that, in the work that I've been doing, I've been challenged for, you know, why are we getting into operational issues? Why are we asking about the implementation of policies when we should simply be providing the evidence as to whether the policies um, might be considered by politicians? Well, we were concerned about the way that evidence was being generated and transmitted to politicians in the United Kingdom. The, there is the Scientific Advisory Group on Emergencies, but initially its membership was secret, its minutes were secret, its recommendations were secret, and ministers were able to say they were following the science, but we had no idea what the science was. So in response, a number of us created an alternative SAGE, an independent SAGE, and what we do is spend a lot of our time voluntarily, several hours every Thursday evening, and then a press briefing every Friday at lunchtime, writing papers, pulling together data, where we explicitly engage with the operational matters, where we explicitly engage with policy. Now, in fact, where we overlap with the official SAGE, we hardly ever disagree. I don't think we've ever disagreed fundamentally. But what we can do is go beyond what they do and we can engage with the public and more importantly, listen to the public because what has become clear is that co-creation of knowledge, listening to people on the front line is crucial on this because otherwise the policy recommendations will simply be wrong. And of course you have your own in Ireland and I congratulate you on that. Uh, I think there have been some very valuable lessons coming out from uh, that too. So thank you for that. I want to conclude with a few very brief words about conferences. Why do we go to conferences? Well, to dis disseminate our findings, to exchange ideas, develop hypotheses and share solutions, but also we go for networking and particularly for early career researchers and to build trust and cement trusted relationships. It, organizing major conferences is not easy as Anthony Staines certainly knows. Uh, it typically involves two years in planning, a vast amount of work by volunteers. Again, I thank the work of our colleagues in Dublin for all of their work on the 2021 European Public Health Conference. The business model is based on break-even number of attendees, and if we don't have that, then you lose money, and that can be hugely problematic. We can look to a hybrid model, which increases price, but if we do that, then we may lose sponsorship from many of the advertisers and others, and we have to ask if they're still viable. We can have online conference platforms, but they never work as well as we would like. Um, broadband speeds can exclude some participants. 
They can reduce spontaneity. Um, they can reduce the possibility to engage with people post-presentation, a particular problem for early career research. We risk having a new form of digital exclusion. How do we find new ways to connect early career researchers? with each other and with more senior researchers. We need new forms of networking. And I'd like to thank my colleague, Sarah McQuinn, for her work on Youth and Next in working very hard to bring people together. Well, I don't claim that this has been a comprehensive overview of doing research during a pandemic. It has been a bit random in terms of the issues that I've been discussing, but I think that they are relevant to all of us in our different ways. And I hope at least there are bases for discussion. So thank you very much.